Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this conversation with John O'Comfort. That's for those of you who haven't already had the conversation with him coming in the way in. We're just saying that John seems to know almost everybody in the audience here, which is lovely, which gives it a kind of even more uh, relaxed atmosphere. And I hope that it will be uh, a conversation not just for John and I to have, but also that you will be able to participate uh, as we go along. We'll, we'll have a few you know, we'll discuss for a little while and then we'll throw it open and, and see how it goes from then onwards. It would be nice to make it as informal and inclusive as possible. Um, most of you will not need a lengthy introduction to John O'Comfra, uh, OBE. You will know that there are four of his films showing here at the festival over the next few days. Um, so we have The March and Hansworth Songs, the Stuart Hall Project, and... Also, Nine Muses, um, which did previously have a name quite difficult to pronounce, which I will have an attempt, <laughs> an attempt at later. And these are all wonderful, complex, highly um, beautiful, beautiful films, very rich in association. And um, I want to discuss with John today some of his inspirations, and also we can go on then a bit to sort of method and also some thoughts about the future as well of filmmaking. Um, so let, let's start, let's go back. Let's go back to childhood and uh, Ghana and then London. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody has early film going or film consuming experiences. Mm -hmm. Do you remember, I mean, maybe not the first time, but the first time it really made that kind of deep, exciting impression on you? Um, yes, I, I do actually. Um, but in in it came in different registers. There was when I knew film was a sort of science or an art, or or that it had a language that one could learn uh, crudely. When I realised that you could be moved by it, and then they were all different times. I, I lived uh, in West London round the corner from a cinema, a rep cinema that's gone now, called the Paris Pullman. And the Paris Pullman showed, you know, traditional kind of rep stuff. So you can see Pasolini on Monday afternoon and then Miso Gucci in the afternoon and Wells in the evening, that kind of thing. Uh, a real program. And as a 14-year-old, I used to bunk in quite a bit. And I did it for about a year, and then they just got fed up <laughs> with me sneaking in and leaving the back doors open. So they just let me in, you know, to, 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 to watch stuff. And I would go in there and watch stuff, 90% of which I didn't understand. But at some point, I kind of got it. I thought, OK, this is, this is really important. So that was just... That was just the fondness for cinema because I was making Super 8 films at school with a really important figure in my life and um, wanted to then learn how to do it, which is why I was bunking into the cinema. But I, I learned that it was a science and an art in the mid-70s because I studied with a guy who's here somewhere in the room at the moment um, on one of the first film studies courses. I think it was an O-level, John, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and John Digens kind of took us through, you know, the early film studies stuff, you know, genre and semiology. And blah, 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 blah. I think I was 18 then. And by then, I kind of knew. Um, one, that I wanted to make it uh, or work in it. And two, that you had to work really hard to understand its codes and its rules and meanings and so on. So, so film studies, as it, as it was being taught then, was there a, a kind of canon? I mean, were there, were there obvious things that you were being pointed to as being great examples? Um, yes and no. Yes, because uh, there were films that were supposed to be the great films in the canon. And John's course was about trying to overturn that somewhat. You know, so he was teaching the less... I mean, you've got to remember, we're 18. <laughs> we didn't know anything about cinema, so it was like an eye-opener anyway. Um, but he was teaching less rarefied genres like the Western or um, 
directors who weren't necessarily seen as the great directors. Um, Sam Fuller, people like that. You know, so you got, to, you got to know cinema in that sort of carrière du cinema way, which isn't just about the A-list, but also about the sort of minor quote-unquote figures who actually did the bread and butter work in cinema. So Sam Fuller, most of the Westerns, um, the great Westerns we watched. Clint Eastwood was a, a, a particular favorite, John, no? Um, <laughs> that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah, but there was, there was no sense, so in that, that it, it felt kind of accessible. It, it didn't feel that it was... Uh... Well, a lot, of it was, a, a lot of it was accessible because, for me at any rate, because um, when I was 17 and a half, 18, I went to the ICA to see the film that kind of changed everything for me, really. Um, it was a film by the Russian director, Andrei Tarkovsky, called Mirror. And I literally didn't understand the frame. I had no idea what it was about. But something in the film moved me. It, it, it's way of telling the story. And that mix of dream and uh, reality, fantasy and fiction, and, you know, documentary, that melange of stuff really rung a kind of um, a series of bells. <laughs> um, and and, and um, threw down a gauntlet. It, it had implications that I'm still working through as, as a you know, person in film. Um, it, it, I suppose it's, it's that moment when you kind of surrender the, the, the sort of rational idea of I must follow everything here and allow yourself to be taken somewhere else. Yeah, well, I mean, because, uh, you know, I didn't answer your first question, so I'm trying to answer that now. I mean, the, the, the films that, um, these were my attempts to study it, but I mean, I'd been introduced to it before, you know, like you got, when you were taken as a kid to see Lawrence of Arabia or Dr. Shivago, Dr. Shivago was my favorite. I mean, when Julie Christie came on in that close up, you were like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never seen anything so staggeringly beautiful in my life. And when I told her that years later, she was absolutely horrified. But it's true, that was the power of cinema. You know, the, the, the sense that something could be almost perfect, an image, um, and something worth attaining. So I suppose the film studies lot was an attempt on my part, even though I didn't understand it, and to understand why I was so moved by those films. Shivago in particular, I thought it was extraordinary. You know, you walked out in inter intermission and, and you got your ice cream, but you couldn't wait to get back. You were like, well, what's going to happen now with Mr. Komarovsky? <laughs> so it, it was plot as much as, because the thing about Lean is often the, just the extraordinary images and the, the way that he will go, you know, cut from one thing to another. So, but it, it, it was the story, the narrative as well. So. And the image. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, Chivago was 70 mil, it was huge. I mean, it just went across this wall. It was huge. You know, so a close-up, and, and there were very few. When, it, when she appeared in that close-up, you were like, whoa, I can see why that guy's after. You know, you literally understood the power of the image in those films. And um, yes, of course, I kind of migrated elsewhere with images and how you thought about them, what you thought they could do, but that very early um, initiation, uh, watching either The Searchers or The Killers, or, you know, I, all of that was, was absolutely important. So what were you making your Super 8 films about? Oh, they use your stuff, 14-year-olds do. <laughs> <laughs> Capers and people stealing from shops and then getting caught. That kind of <laughs> fairly kind of crude plot-driven stuff but you know um, the, the thing that I learned um, because what you had to do was um, we were divided into groups and in the class the super eight class it was a kind of after school class so you could do what you want but essentially the guy who ran it said you know I need two or three people to do the camera and then two or three to do light you know so we were split and I was in the editing 
department. Mm. Um, and it really, it was there that I learned how um, narratives come about, you know, because before I went to the class, I just assumed what was shot, like everyone, is what you saw on screen. I didn't understand that there was this other mediating space where things are shot and then they're rearranged and <laughs> all of that. So I learned that very early on, yeah. And you learned about the power of, uh, of putting one image against another and how, it can, Especially. how they can sort of bleed into each other and Especially, affect each other. Yeah. I mean, I think most of the time, um, um, what happens, and I, I think this is true for most people, is that you, it's not so much that you learn something then, you're exposed to something and it's only later on that you realize that the exposure to it was teaching you something. You know, I didn't, I didn't really, I, didn't, I don't think I learned about editing until we had to edit and then I realized that what we were doing in that class <laughs> was about that, <laughs> if you see what I mean. It's a sort of weird, um, the same with, with um, uh, Tarkovsky's Mirror. It wasn't really until much later on when we started to make stuff that I realized that it had a kind of legitimizing function on what I imagined to be possible with the cinema. You know? mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so that, that's cool, but when you, when, you get to, when you get beyond the school bit and sort of to college and things, you know, film societies, film clubs, it's all getting, is it getting more esoteric then? Is it getting yeah. more? <laughs> <laughs> it, it certainly gets more, more esoteric. I mean, you know, um, I did my O-levels with Joe and I moved to another college in the centre of London and the first thing that we did was to occupy the college. <laughs> because it was the 70s. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and that's what you did yeah. as a student. And the second was to set up a film club. Um, uh, ostensibly just to get the films that um, we couldn't afford to go and watch. You know, um, there, were, there was another cinema chain in the, in the West End called the Academy. And the Academy showed all these great European art cinema classics, you know, um, or director, Jan Skoll, you know, like um, but you could also then hire them as 16 mil films from a place called Harris Films. Um, you could just hire them for, for a week, so we would hire The Red and the Blue or Derek Jarman, Sebastiani. In fact, Jarman Sebastiani was the film that we kind of started off with, and that was incredible. <laughs> It was quite a powerful one to start with. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this was a further education college, so you're, you know, you're trying to um, do those acts of provocation that I still believe cinema should be about. And I knew it would be controversial. I knew people wouldn't like it, but I didn't realise they would dislike it as much as they did. You know? <laughs> um, so at about halfway through, somebody kicks the projector, and then they say, I don't want to watch this stuff. Why are you showing us this filth? And, and then the next two hours, we just talked about homophobia and sexuality. And, uh, you know, so it, was a, it, it did the job of introducing a conversation. Did you know German? I did, yes, I yeah. did. Um, not very well. I mean, Jarman was... Um, no, that's not true. I knew him very well, but I wasn't part of his coterie of mm. sort of allies and supporters. He had a very, very close-knit circle, an army almost, of supporters and colleagues that he worked with. But I knew him and uh, met him uh, several times. And I was sorry he went, actually, because he was, he was a remarkable voice. And, and a necessary one. And when he went, something happened. Mm. It was a change, you know. I mean, German's one of the few people who married all the different concerns that I had with images. Because once I went to university, one of the people I studied under was a, a guy called Simon Field. And Simon Field was um, an expert in avant-garde cinema. So he would show us anything from Stan Brackage to Maya Deren to Hollis Frampton. So I saw all of that as well. By the time I got to university, I'd seen just about every, the top 100 great films. <laughs> I'd seen all of that. Um, but I, I hadn't seen any avant-garde work at all. Um, and that was a revelation. So 
the encounter with Jarman's later work, not the Sebastianis, but later stuff, you realize there was a way of marrying these different traditions, you know, and he did it remarkably well, you know, because uh, he was also someone who was influenced by those streams of cinema, you know. So by the time you got to university, you already knew you wanted to be a filmmaker, did you, or was it? Um, Good question. Um, not really. I mean, no, I, I knew that I wanted to make it or make films, but not a filmmaker. I was still searching for um, um, a constituency. You know, uh, it, felt, it felt kind of lonely, you know. Um, West London at the time didn't, the, well, the part of West London I grew up in didn't have that many bad people. <laughs> Okay, uh, and uh, by the time I was 19, I kind of knew that I needed to talk to others just to see what they were thinking. So getting to university was the, or polytechnic, let me just be correct here, um, was a way of connecting with other people who'd come from roughly, broadly similar backgrounds. And it's in that what was initially a set of discussion groups that became an art group that the ambition grew. And so it was more, um, I suppose at that stage, you, I mean, obviously you would have, you've been quite politically aware from early on, I would imagine, because both your parents were yes. sort of politically engaged. So it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, a lot of people go to college and then suddenly kind of wake up, but that wouldn't have been the case with you. No, I come from a communist family and, um, you know, <laughs> I remember my mum used to say to me, you know, um, this is it's a remarkable thing about the left, uh, especially the African left. So, you know, you're 13 and you come home and you say to your mom, oh, I just, I just bumped into this woman in the street and I did what you said. I said hello and, uh, and she said, you know, go back home, you black baboon. You know, and she said, really? Well, when you see her again, tell her you are communist. <laughs> 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 and, the, <laughs> and, the, and the idea the African left had was just by being part of this international community, that you were crazy. exempt from certain things, <laughs> including racism. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that was something we'd, we'd, we'd sort of, I, I kind of learned from me. I mean, I, I think there was, um, essentially what had happened was that um, uh, we lived in this weird, in the 70s, weird schizophrenic environment here, where all kinds of phantoms stalked the landscape, you know. And the main one was the one that, that sat on one of your shoulders and tried to persuade you that you were crazy. You know, uh, it said, no, like, it's not happening. Everybody in the culture, the union in authority when I was a kid, was keen to persuade you that nothing's happening because of your color. It's all right, no one's, it don't mean, nobody means it, don't worry. Everything said, everybody who could say anything said everything was cool. But your experience of the place didn't feel like that. You know, so you lived in this really weird schizoid space, you know. Uh, so f there was a while when I thought, oh, you know, yes, I'm from this left family, but it's not really helping. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not, it's not calming the voices, you know. Um, and it's really when I was about 18 or 19 that I started to return to it myself, to the left myself, but not via Moscow or China or Yugoslavia, you know, not my mum and dad's version of communism, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and certainly not the universal panacea, you know, uh, for, for all ills, uh, which they thought. Um, so, no, I didn't learn about being political, because that came with the upbringing. But, but it had to be adapted to fit this place. And, and in the light of my conversations and encounters with other young people of colour, you know, um, I mean, a great question for us was, you know, how do we fit uh, 
um, race into this mosaic of stuff. You know, I mean, if you care about class struggle and you care about gender equality, you know, how, how do all these things fit together? You know, um, and which theory <laughs> or theories? Yeah. Can, would allow them to all coexist. Because you know, the way. 70s, of course, was very full of theories. Well, the 60s were full of theories, but the 70s probably more so. It all got more codified. And, yeah. yeah. Well, the, my sense was, I mean, the, the, the 60s, weirdly, I, you know, um, I, I've said before that I, I mean, I, I grew up in this country, but actually I grew up in an exiled African home, meeting lots of people, all of whom are from failed revolutions all over the, the African black world. Um, that was my 60s. The 70s was sort of this country, really. That was, you know, when I was old enough to walk out, <laughs> uh, I was then exposed to other sorts of stuff. And the theory was the first thing that you, you knew you had to get your head around, you know. And, and so I, I searched for it, uh, studied groups all over the place. Race Today, for instance, um, used to run a study group. There was another group in Brixton called the Black Liberator um, magazine that when you opened, you thought, Jesus, I need two degrees to understand this. It was really, really complicated. <laughs> um, but at the back of it, it said, if you didn't get it, there was a study group. <laughs> okay. I went to the study group because yeah, I wanted to understand this Althusser Marxist, you know. Um, no, it's heavy theory based mm -hmm. decade, I think. But then, I mean, the, the, the sort of the politics and, and the creative impulse kind of coalesce around, around a group of, so how, how did you come together then as a group? Um, I had met uh, half of what became Black Audio Collective in 76, 77, because some of them were on this film studies course with me in, in Whitechapel. Um, and Whitechapel was a trip for a West London boy in the 70s. I mean, it was, it was a real trip. It was my first proper encounter with class. I mean, and how it organized this place. So I gravitated towards another bunch of uh, young black kids because they were so different. But they were also what I was looking for. I could tell looking at them that they all knew things that I needed to know, you know. So I went towards them. And, and that group basically went through O levels and A levels and occupations and political parties, we did all of that together and arrived in Portsmouth in 81. No, 80, I think. What am I talking about? I left in 82, so I must have been got there, 79. Help, Lena, when did I go to Portsmouth? 79. 79, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's a long time yeah, ago. Yeah. You know? It is a long time um, ago. <laughs> and we then, that group, the, the Whitechapel group, mm -hmm. then met the East London group, you know, who were three people in the art department at the time. Um, you know, again, discussing um, political demonstrations and stuff. I think what united us was that all of us wanted to make stuff. We wanted to make things that might somehow give voices or images or shape to what we were doing on the streets and the anti-Nazi leagues and rock against race. We all wanted to make things that would sort of um, give voice to that. So I suppose Black Audio Film Collective, which is the group that we ended up setting up in 82, grew out of those two currents and, and specifically the kind of ideological need for that group to not just raise placards, <laughs> but to make things to installations or um, performance pieces or, you know, and I, you know, I don't know how and why we thought that, but that was a very strongly felt need. 
And you didn't, and it was across a whole range of, you know, with gallery or eventually it would be television or whatever it would be. I mean, with that gallery cinema, whatever, you didn't, in a sense, mind particularly, or you were just interested in all of those things. We were, you thing. know, like in, in, in 82, uh, uh, there was a big, a letter arrived from Wolverhampton and he said, calling all black art students to come uh, if you're interested in these questions, come. So I went to with the group to, to Wolverhampton in '82, and there were about 80 people. There were 80 students of color across the country who were interested in making things. And the the key argument was between people like myself, who said that the designations and the categories shouldn't matter. You know, art, film, cinema. That's all bullshit because. Actually, we were just beginning to get onto the platform. So what was more important for us, or should have been more important for us, was processes. You know, the process of acquiring speech or facility. Those were the things that were important. If we got, if, you know, we, then we shouldn't get caught too quickly in categorizing and balkanizing and expertise, because we didn't have any across them anyway. So it didn't, it didn't really matter whether you called yourself an artist or a filmmaker, you still didn't know how to do any of those things. And, and in a way, I still sort of believe that. I mean, I, you know, we spent 15 years in the 90s in television, but I still believed even then that what mattered most was the process by which you acquired insight into making things rather than where it was going to end up. That's, you know, that's not... That. The reasons we went to television were <laughs> complicated and we can get yeah, to that. Yeah, but, yeah. but all I'm saying now is that at the time, I still believe that the, the question of these demarcations into categories of art, cinema, film were, were meaningless for us. So in order to make them, how did you get the funding? How did you do it? Well, um, all sorts of stuff. I mean, um, the stuff that we did at college, which were mainly installations, and usually to commemorate something. So, um, you know, um, I don't know, black. There, there, there wasn't a Black History Month at the time, but there would be something, you know, or the hunger strikes in Bobby Sands' hunger strikes. We would always make something for those events, and, and you just use your grant money. <laughs> Yeah. That's the way of doing it. Um, when we left, um, I mean, I would work. Most of us worked um, on films in one form or another. I worked as a production designer or an assistant to a production designer or an assistant to costume. You know, anything that you could do to get money to, to make stuff, we, we pretty much did. Mm. And th the fact that there was, um, and there was also a sort of, a higher profile kind of political situation emerging. 81 was you get the first uh, riots in Birmingham and Liverpool and London yes. as well. Um, and so did that feel at that point that clearly there was a very urgent need for, you know, a stronger artistic yeah. response? I mean, that's what 81 did more than anything for my generation, the, 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 you know, the class of... 76, so those of us who came of age, you know, voting age in 76, you know. 81 sort of threw the ethical gauntlet down for us. You know, it said, listen, um, uh, th this post-utopian moment that we're living through, and I mean that very seriously because you know, you have parents from, from the Caribbean, from Africa, India, who'd, you know, some of them had saved money and, uh, and they'd travel thousands of miles, you know, having worked for years to get here. You, know, you do that because you think things are going to be better on the other side, you know. And through us, mainly, they'd learned that things were not going to be better, <laughs> you know, because we were failing at schools, we were being locked up galore by sus laws, all kinds of stuff, you know. We were just, you know, if, if you were a parent and you looked at what was happening to your kids, uh, and saw what was happening to us, you would have thought, okay, this was a mistake. I, you know, I shouldn't have done this. It, so that post-utopian moment was one that the uh, riots, and I'm going to call them riots because they were absolutely that, said, 
we have an answer for. You know, we will burn down what does not work for us. And, and we're going to do those as defined gestures, and we expect you, the society, to then say to us, oh, don't burn it down, have this, or don't burn it down, let's do that. You know, so it, it, it was an extreme political voice, <laughs> but it was one all the same. And, and the ethical gauntlet was, if you did not believe that that was the way forward, then what do you do? Because just going to university and qualifying and going and getting a job was not an option. 81 did that. It sort of clarified in the way that you know, people talk about it, you know, um, Spanish Civil War, Syria. You know, there, there are these moments when, you know, when, you've, when you're part of a group, you, you just feel as if you have to have a position <coughs> one way or the other. There's, there weren't, the space for neutrality didn't exist. You know, so very important as a catalyst for what we, what we went on to do. I mean, I don't think in the way that you know, kind of cheap sociology after the fact uh, wrote, I don't think it was just a simple causal relation. You know, I don't think, you know, we didn't just see the rights and think, oh, we want to make films. <laughs> no, <laughs> or or saw the rights and, and, and then money came from, <laughs> like, manner from heaven. You know, it, it wasn't quite that simple. But it did, it did pose a question that you knew you had to answer, which is, you know, if, if, if the representational strategies of disorder weren't and shouldn't be the norm, then what are the other alternatives? Because it was clear that representation was on the cards and it was either political or ideological or iconic or, you know, all of those things, you know. You're talking about, sorry to go on about this, but just one more, you know, you're talking about, um, this was the, the gulf between us and the host culture, you know. Um, routinely, as the riots unfolded, you would get pundits or newscasters sitting in studio saying, well, the reason why these kids are doing it, you see, is because they don't know who they are or what they are. That was a Tory MP, it's a, 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 an exact quote. <laughs> They don't know who they are and what they are. Um, so you really did then think, okay, well, how, how do we tell people that these dangerous knowings that were out on the street were not as a result of ignorance? <laughs> yeah. How do you say to people, we actually do know who we are? The problem is how we express it. Because it's extraordinary looking at Hansworth songs, which you made in, uh, well, you made it in 86, and what is was seen in 86 anyway, um, which is looking back over over that period, um, 85, 81, that whole period. And you hear these voices, you hear people opining mm. about what it is. And it's extraordinary. It sounds like something from another century, actually, when you listen now. And it was. I mean, I, I think a lot's changed. You know. But, I mean, did it feel even by the time that you made that, was, was there already that kind of perspective that you could see? Yeah, I mean, I think... We started in um, the summer of 85, going to Birmingham because we were invited there as a collective by friends and allies there to come and just document and they knew we were doing this. This was, this was when you get the, the next lot of, yeah. sort of unrest at that yeah. stage, yeah. Um, and, and one of the reasons why we went was because we were then doing this research project. A lot of the stuff we did was mainly research-based uh, as part of this commitment to processes trying to invent processes by which you make things. Research projects, some of which ended up as films or tape slides or, you know, but generally the main activity was research. Because the question we were trying to answer in the, in the research project called Different Desires was, um, was this. You know, it, it was clear that something called the post-industrial was coming. And, and we had, as people of colour come from communities which play this in classical Marxist terms, reserve army of labour roles, right? So we, we, you know, your parents are brought in. 
basically as the reserve army of labor because there was a shortage. But that reserve army, it, it was clear, if, it is, if this post-industrial thing <laughs> was real, it, it would mean that this reserve army wasn't going to be needed. And, and, and even more crucially, it meant that us, <laughs> their kids, would be surplus. So we, we weren't just the underclass, we were, we were going to be a surplus underclass. <laughs> so what do you do when you're part of a surplus underclass? And what does, how does a society basically take in to itself, you know, essentially what it had decided by its political economic regimes, it doesn't need. That was the research. Uh, and so when hands were happy, we were like, aha, there may be clues here. So we went essentially to film and interview people. It was only really as we were doing that, other events started to kick off in Tottenham and blah, blah, blah. And by the time it was all done, the arguments were already had. And on the whole, the right had won. You know, because the argument really was between um, sociological definitions of discord and um, raciological ones, for want of a better word. You know, on the left, people would say routinely on television or radio or newsprint, uh, "Oh, these things are happening because of deprivation, you know, unemployment." Blah, blah, blah. To which the right would generally say, "Aha! But if that's what's happening." how come people are not writing in Newcastle? <laughs> um, to which the left wouldn't have an answer, you know. Um, and so by the end of 85, we kind of knew we had to take on this argument. Um, and one of the ways you did it, as with most things, um, is to first accept the premise of the argument. Yes, you're right, it is about race. <laughs> Yes, you're right, it's definitely crime. Yes, you're right, uh, most of the kids on the street are too young to be on the street and should really be at home and, and are, you know, from broken, yeah, yes, 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 yes. The question is why? <laughs> this was the question we tried to answer um, by first accepting the premise of what was essentially a right-wing argument, which is that these are race riots being committed by criminals, as a way of not answering the structural questions, you know. Uh, so we accepted that argument uh, and tried to work through that. But when you make the film about it, you don't make a film that is in any way predictable in the way it tackles this, because, you know, you could have... You stood up and put that case forward in, mm. if you like, the kind of grammar of, of a, lot of, yes. um, a lot of the political discussion at the time, but instead of which you have this fascinating way of cutting together archive and using sound and, you know, putting things side by side so that it becomes so much more involving mm. and interesting. I mean, you, were you always absolutely confident from the beginning that you would do it that way? Yes. Um, we didn't know that it would end up like that. But that, that's what I meant initially by the process. I mean, I believed as a member of that collective absolutely in, in our way of constructing uh, arguments via montage. I believed absolutely in that. I believed profoundly in the subversive value of bricolage of things, you know, and that's when the, the suddenly the, the Tarkovskys and, you know, Renés start to make sense. You think, okay, you know, yeah, we are right to feel this. This is okay. <laughs> it has a tradition, you know. So the process I'm talking about, it was, is really one of initiating ways of looking and trying things that, that are based on a kind of accumulated set of insights into other ways. You, you couldn't have done what we did without having some idea of the history of cinema. You just couldn't. Uh, because the, the, the history of cinema told you that this is possible. You know, I remember having this long, uh, 
discussion with one of the guys who really helped us enormously, you know, um, Stuart Hall. Um, and he came to, we invited him, he came to watch uh, the cuts and one of the arguments was about whether we can completely bypass using voices from the present. You know, um, and we kept insisting, and in the end I think he bought it, you know, we kept insisting that there was no legitimacy to the voices in the present unless people accepted that there were voices from the past, which equally had a right to be there. Because in fact, when you looked at it, that was all that we could see. We, all that you saw in Handsworth were all these phantoms of miserable projects that had gone wrong, you know, whether it's policing or housing or education. Or, these are all ghosts and they haunted the scene, you know. Um, so unless these had a voice, there was no point. I mean, you know, like, it, it, I've always believed in this idea, and I think I learned that in that group, that the ethnographic um, voice in and of itself is sometimes useful, but it's not always holy. In other words, you know, I can go and speak to any black person in the street and talk to them for hours, would that tell me something about the history of racism? No. Why would listening to someone's voice tell you something about structural features of a culture? And why would you assume that they necessarily would have access to that? Because they're black? <laughs> or, you know, I, I just, we never believed in the ethnographic veracity of personal experience. However important it is, I just thought there were other things which were important. So instead, you decide that you're going to go for more of a, a if you like, a kind of cubist or mosaic yes. effect. Um, yes, but um, not initially. I mean, I, you know, the, the impulse was to first record. So we did interview people, lots of them, and we did observe, and we did all the standard things documentary filmmakers are supposed to do, observe and you know, interview, and, you know, all that actuality. We shot all of that. Um, and we did put it together. It's just that when, when you did that, you, you could just feel the reasons vacating. <laughs> Literally, each cut, you just lost one more take on it. So it's like, well, because you're caught in this signifying chain where people are saying to you what they've heard somebody say on TV or what they read. You know, it's like this chasm, this void of nothingness where things were, uh, there was this loop and we had to break the loop, you know. Um, because when you say to somebody, why do you think they're right? And they're, well, you know, I think the police, uh, the, they tell you what they think. <laughs> or what they think you want to hear. Yeah. Um, and it, in the course of doing that, we, I had this realization that there was an ethical position to be occupied, which involved foregrounding what we knew as much as anyone else, because we were also part of this drama. And any attempt to just say, well, I spoke to people behind the camp, all of that usual kind of, you know, weren't gonna get us around this question, which is why did this, why did this thing happen? Um, why did it have all these features to it? And what, what did it have to do with black people? <laughs> you know, uh, we had to answer that question, even if it's just for ourselves. And how long did it take you to, to put that film together? Because this was the first time you'd made something at that length, presumably, of that yes. complexity. Yeah. It was the first time we'd made anything <laughs> <laughs> that was normal. <laughs> you know, and, I, and I know most people said it wasn't normal, but for us it was very normal. Um, a year of editing. Um, so lots of trying things. I lots of trying yeah. things and, and allowing the, 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 the editing strategies themselves to define what else to go for. You know, kept shooting things as we went along. And, you know, um, because we'd argued um, with all of these institutions that we needed a workshop and, and from 82 
we'd had tiny bits of money to buy equipment, you know, a steam bag and a camera. You know, we'd argued for it over four years, you know. So it felt that now that we had it, that space, we should use it for that. You know, that we didn't have to pay anyone except ourselves, and so if we didn't want to pay ourselves, we just went without, you know. So, yeah, we had a year to work on, on it in any way that we defined without commission editors, execs, uh, none of that stuff. <laughs> it was just us and the people we invited in to, to talk to us. Which was, I mean, with hindsight, an extraordinary position to be in. But the, I mean, this seems a good moment at which to sort of open it up to, I, I don't know if um, I was going to talk about some of the later work too, but I don't, I don't know if people who've seen Hansworth songs would like to ask anything or contribute anything at this point. We do have some microphones. There. there they are, poised on the side. Of, I, I can't actually see if anybody's got their hand up or wants to speak at this stage. Otherwise, we'll carry on. All very quiet. You don't have to. But no, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a hand just here. Yeah. Sorry, I can't really see. Uh, hi, John. I'm Tom. Uh, I'm a director of photography. Um, I just wondered how you felt about um, what happened in 2011 and the riots around Tottenham there, if, if you wanted to... I don't know if you were in London at, at the time, if you have anything to say about that. Uh, yeah, no, I, well, I have a lot and not that much at the same time. Um, quite a lot of it happened outside our offices. So, um, um, I mean, one of the things that I thought was interesting uh, about them was how many people called us me in particular, to say, would you do something on this? And it's almost like they'd not learnt the main lesson from Hansworth songs, which is you do it for yourself, you know. I mean, the, most of the people involved in the riots and disturbances were my son's age, you know. And it should be their age who made something, so, you know, because they know what the central issues are, you know. I'm not sure, they don't necessarily know how to make something um, completely out of it, but they're the ones who it has to start with. It can't, you know, I mean, and that's not gonna change. I will never make another film about a riot unless I'm part of it. And that seems unlikely. <laughs> um, unless it's some sort of history film or, do you know what I mean? But we're not gonna do, um, I mean, I was talking to a lot of people who were involved in trying to make something about it, saying to them, follow the question of law. It's just really interesting what happens to um, the figure of the law. Um, because a lot of the times, um, it plays this strange spectral role <laughs> in all of this. So. Um, you talk to anyone across the world where there are riots, and nine out of ten, it involves policing. Nine out of ten. Yeah? Um, but then something very strange happens. So something is set off by policing in one form or another, whether it's Ferguson or Tottenham or, you know, wherever. And then the the figures of authority, their law, exit stage left and appear stage right, as if none of this has anything to do with them. And they go, no, 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 no calm down. <laughs> um, which is usually when the second act happens, because people go, fuck you, what do you mean calm down? You started this shit. <laughs> and then the dialectic begins. You know, um, so I was trying to get people to not point, don't look at the participants and define them purely as the rioters. Look at the police for once. Just look at what happens with policing around these things. Um, but it's difficult, you know, especially now. Getting access to that sort of stuff is, is difficult. You know. But that's what I would do. I would make something about this really weird process by which coppers start shit, fuck off, come back again <laughs> as the guardians. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting narrative. I mean, when, when you look at uh, 
when you look at Hansworth songs now, which you, which you probably don't very often, but when, when, you, when you consider it now, I, mean, I think that, you know, someone actually wrote something, didn't he, a few years afterwards, in which he said, oh, well, you know, things are a bit different now. I mean, do you see, though, and, and going, you know, connecting with this question as well, mm. you say you wouldn't make that film now because you're not of that generation, but do you see the same... It, would you look back now and maybe make a different film about Hansworth songs, knowing what we know later? Mm. Um, I mean, I think we could. Um, and, you know, I had this interesting conversation with Penny Wilcock, who was working in Hansworth a couple of years back, and she said, oh, it's really interesting, you should come and see what's happened, because a lot of um, the, the landscape that you were covering and the means, the ways of demarcating the actors and it's changed dramatically and all this sort of stuff happening. I said, yes, absolutely. That would be the case. <laughs> you know, uh, That's for someone else. I mean, our, our thing was really a rhetorical strategy by which you said something very simple. Uh, and, and that is that when these things happen, there are invariably all sorts of ghosts. And the ones that very rarely get spoken about. The intangible ones are probably the most important ones. You know, so um, I know for a fact that if generations of um, African, Caribbean, uh, South Asian families, or at least the, the parents, had felt comfortable, secure, uh, in that space, there will be no riots. You know, riots, riots breed on the precarity of, of, of you know, kind of minority lives. Really. Uh, they, they sort of take shape in the gaps in that precarity, you know. Um, and they don't get settled, you know, secure, comfortable communities. They don't, they don't no. need to. <laughs> no, exactly. Anybody else at this stage? Yes, up at the back. Um, sorry, you're going to have to run up there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to pick up an interesting actually I'm glad I got to you asked the you raised the question John about the need for it to come from them and it's, it's interesting there was a film made um, a feature documentary made after 2011 by 14 young people who came together and the film was called Right From Wrong and the group has since formed themselves into a filmmaking group called Fully Focus which I think you probably know John and that was an interesting piece because that was then a group of young people most of whom were involved in those rights focusing in the way that I've been mean, representing their voices, but also questioning the law in that way. But what was really interesting about it was two years ago here at this event, we brought them together with an, another group of young people that Penny made, a, made her film in response to that question that she raised with you. And what was interesting about it, that was Penny went to Birmingham to make a film with her as a filmmaker. But the most interesting outcome of that was that was the formation of, of the, the cast of that film forming into an activist campaigning group. And what was interesting about the event we did two years ago was to bring them together with Fully Focused to look at kind of tackling those questions. And since then, the film Right From Wrong has had 100 screenings outside the usual distribution circuit. And they took it last at the end of last year <laughs> took it to, um, to the States and went to Ferguson and toured and interesting connections were, were, were made there. So it, it, for me, it's kind of a reinforcement of actually, you know, th there is a point when the voice, ha when the only role we can play is to actually give the tools and the skills to those people to actually begin to talk about it from their point of view. We were there in 85 and 81, but we're not there now. Um, but it's, the film is right from wrong, and I'm going to unashamedly plug it. Because it was made <laughs> I think you're doing that quite well. <laughs> <young people. laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. But, but okay, so that raises an interesting point. You see, so back in the 80s, so you have Channel 4, you have yes. television, you can get stuff out through television. Now, um, a film like that will have to have special screenings. And, yes, yeah. it, it, it does, but I'm, you know, and you're right. The, the thing, though, is um, there are people here. Uh, 
who were part of that initial argument with uh, you know, the DCMS and then the commission set up to look into the emergence of Channel 4 and then Channel 4 itself about what it would that it would show. I mean, and you had to fight for it. It wasn't, you know, I remember going to independent IFA meetings, independent film Associ filmmakers association meetings. Many of us weren't even convinced we wanted to be on television. You know, uh, I, I know filmmakers now take it for granted, but in 1982, not every, you know, film person necessarily wanted to be on television. It wasn't the be all and end all of our lives, you know. Um, what had changed things for a lot of us were a series of conferences that start off in 76 with the Brecht conference in, in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Film Festival, where, you know, the, the, the language of Gramsci and uh, the, the slow thaw of our relations with the mainstream began then and people started to say, well, if you take Gramsci seriously and you take hegemony seriously, then you have to go inside it and work in, you know, mm -hmm. you know. so by 82, you know, slowly people were being convinced. But, you know, we, we, we went to, there was a, a big meeting at Cinema Action in 1984 when, you know, the thing that people take for granted about, you know, quote unquote, black film work in the 80s, wasn't accepted. I mean, you know, we were in a, in a room about this big of people. We were a minority arguing for collective work. You know, uh, there are many people, uh, black journalists and filmmakers who were like, this is rubbish, you know, you're just going to ghettoize us and we want to get into the BBC. <laughs> we don't want to work for Channel 4. I mean, these were really complicated arguments and, and you had to fight them to win them, you know. So, the, the arrival of Channel 4 um, in 82 and our presence on it by 86, 87 was as a result of some of these kind of battles in the background. Um, and I'm afraid if people have to make those arguments, it's, it's not a right. <laughs> you know, uh, you have to fight for those rights if you don't feel that they're there now. Uh, and also, crucially, I'm like, not sure. You know, it meant something to us. It meant something, you know, to see cinema actions so that you can live, which is this amazing film essay using the work of Raymond Williams to look at the Welsh border country and how you film history. I mean, it was just to see that on television felt like a triumph. You were like, Oh yeah, <laughs> we got something that we understand and like for a change on. And I, I, you know, I was there the first day it was shown in '82, watching it, thinking, yeah, fantastic. You know, do you need? Does anyone feel that excited? <laughs> Film being on TV now? I don't think so. No, yeah. well, that, I mean, that's that's the pity of it. Is it? Yeah. Is yeah. that it's not uh, that you don't have that same kind of appetite amongst those who commission and, and select. Yeah, but but it, it's also to do with this something else that. Um, I think it's worth uh, pointing out. I mean, like we, we didn't, I don't think any of us, and in any of the conversations, either in the IFA or the black media workers or, you know, the screen conferences on, you know, screen theory, and, and none of those fora or spaces in which, you know, we found ourselves in the black artist group, and, you know, no one felt that you needed to, put it this way, everyone felt they had something to say. And they didn't necessarily feel that the spaces in which you got to say them legitimized that speech. You know, um, I mean, if I look at Handsworth songs now, about 30% of what ended up on screen was stuff I shot. You know, and I look at it now, bits of it makes me cringe because I can see that I've got a zoom lens at the top end filming something with no tripod and it's going up and down. And now I know better I wouldn't do that, but it didn't matter. <laughs> it didn't matter. The point was that, that I knew we were just gathering that to use it for something else, you know. Um, 
and, and I think that was a generational feeling. And people just felt they had things to say and they wanted to say it in the best ways that they could because they hadn't been done before. And they slowly accepted that it would happen on television. Um, but they also knew that if it didn't happen on television, well, tough shit, there were other places. You know, it wasn't the place we were dying to get on. You know? um, and, and I'm glad that there are people now who don't feel that that's a bit on an end all, because it's especially now not the be on an end all, and shouldn't be. You know, uh, there are other spaces. And I mean, over the years, you, you've done um, non-fiction and fictional work as well for, for television. And, um, I suppose because your work is, is so rich and complex and will blend the lyrical with the, the factual, there's, there's always... It's never as simple either way, is it? No. One way or another. So, but did you, did you find yourself thinking just that certain subjects were suited to that, or did you decide that you wanted to make more, you know, feature films rather than, rather than yeah. factual ones? Um, yeah. A lot of it was just to do with what you were able to raise yeah. monies for, um, and also. Um, the historical transformations. Like, I mean, there was a, there was a point, you know, uh, Channel 4 comes uh, via the independent film and video people to see Handsworth songs in, in our space when we were cutting it. And Alan Fountain says, I love this, we're gonna buy it. You know, and we said, great, because that will allow us to finish it. He gives us the money. Mm -hmm. And he goes, and he comes back, you know, I don't know, a year later or something to claim <laughs> what belonged to them. And, you know, that year, in 87, when Liz Forgan goes to the pre-Italia to talk about what was best about Channel 4, that's the film they take. They hadn't commissioned it, but that's the film they took, you know. And there was a sense that inside those institutions you were wanted and needed to do, but that changes. I mean, a decade after, it, it almost evaporated, you know. I mean, I, in, in Channel 4, the pejorative for describing what we did was constructed films. <laughs> that was seen as a, a kind of insult. <laughs> you mean, as the, the rest sort of dropped from the sky. Exactly. <laughs> constructed, you have meetings with be, you know, Channel 4 documentary, and they say, oh yeah, but you make constructed films, don't you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> as opposed to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so weirdly, the 90s was when I also started doing more fiction, partly because of that yeah. need to move away from yes. the constraints. But, you, but you've continued to work, I mean, you continue to have a sort of fruitful relationship with television and, for yes. example, um, you know, you, you more recently did The March, which was about the 1963 Martin Luther King, um, in a sense, the, the factual account of what happened before Selma, the movie, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Almost exactly in chronological terms. No, absolutely. It? Just before that. Absolutely. I mean, I've learned, I think, not just myself, but people, like, I think we've learned over the years, uh, sometimes painfully, but on the whole, uh, with a certain the kind of liberation attached to it, that um, there are a number of spaces, platforms, uh, that we quite like working in, because the work circulates across those platforms um, and spaces. So what, what's become um, critical is to work out what belongs to which. You know, uh, I've just finished something for the Venice Biennale uh, on Moby Dick. I mean, Moby Dick's a starting point that goes off into the yeah, Africans trying to come over on boats, uh, you know, all of that. Um, and it so happens that someone in television would like to see that turned into a TV film, but that's not the impulse. And the impulse is to create something specifically for the gallery world and then walk away from, unless you feel like there's a need to then make some sort of translation of that work into another space. Um, I, I love television, I, you know. Because that, that can work too, for something like the Stuart Hall project, you had, exactly. you had the film which was two and a half hours yes. long, and then you also have uh, the piece that was in Tate, yes. uh, which is a sort of triptych and yeah. 
So what, did you think of the two at the same time? or did No, I, I, know, I mean, the, the, the triptych is actually what comes first. That's, that's what um, Stuart and myself and uh, the people of Autograph uh, set off to do. And um, uh, because the idea was initially just to do something with him about images in the, in, the, in, the, in the last century. And it slowly sort of morphed into that as he became more and more ill and mm -hmm. couldn't actively be part of it. So suddenly realized that you could use him as the center of it. Um, so that came first. But that, the, the conceit, the argument of the unfinished conversation pretty much ends for me in 1968. And there was still, you know, a lot of stuff to Decades watch. Decades of, of Stuart Moore, yes. <laughs> so the question then yes. was, you know, what, you know, which is what? So they're partly pragmatic, but also, you know, just the realization sometimes. That, you know, you know this. You know that whatever you make, you're, you're going to make for the gallery world is not going to get as many people to see it, you know, because it doesn't show that often. And um, we were keen for some of what came from that world to, to migrate to, to the cinema world, which is what led to... to because the Stuart Hall project is, is it's a fascinating film, but and it's but it's suffused with a kind of elegy for the idea of the public intellectual that we don't we don't really have those anymore. Is that something that you regret? Yes. No. I mean that that I will admit to <laughs> straight away. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, because because so much of um, how and what I learned growing up was through those figures you know when you first saw Stuart Hall um, on, on television Saturday afternoon I mean it was extraordinary you know um, when I heard Raymond Williams or saw him on arena or heard him on a radio you know these were kind of like major figures who sort of opened your your world both by what they said as well as the example of them their themness, <laughs> their, their being, their ontology, sort of, you know, you're like, okay, so Raymond Williams is from a working class, humble background, and goes to Cambridge. You know, you just yeah. felt, you know, as he said it, and you looked at him, you thought, oh, okay. It licensed things in you. Uh, and I think the, the more, it's a pity, really, there are not more figures like that. But the reasons for that are so complicated. <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to be able to go into that. Well, and and it may be also that, you know, perhaps pop stars and comedians move into those public pronouncement roles. Yes, they have. Um, rather more. And some more successfully and much yeah. more interestingly than others. Yes. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions from that. <laughs> Does anybody else want to, to add something at this point or ask anything? Because press on, Prince Warren. Looks <laughs> so you're about to put your hand up. You do you are going to put your hand up again. <laughs> well, just, you mentioned ghosts like about eight times, and yeah. I was quite interested in you know, the word spectre as well. Mm. I just wondered, so you said you were a very kind of communist beginning, but I mean, were you taught kind of um, some of the, the stuff from, from Ghana as well, like the cultures to do with ghosts and that, or was your parents not into that and they were just into the kind of modernistic way of being and didn't bring up that stuff? Because I know there's a whole heritage and relation, relations to ghosts in the the bush doctors and stuff in Ghana, so... Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> no, actually... The first, um, the first lesson about ghosts that I got from my mum was the opening of the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> Go and read it. It says, there's a spectre haunting Europe. That's how it starts. <laughs> The spectre of communism. That's the first one. I was like, what's a fucking spectre? <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time I, I know. But, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, you can't be of um, uh, African descent without also being aware in, in the, of the complicated ways in which you, you are ghosted, you know. Uh, and... Uh, Race itself is a kind of ghosting, you know. Uh, that's the first thing you learnt, actually, because, you know, I was telling you jokingly about this woman calling me a, a black baboon at 13, and you, you, when you heard it, you thought, okay, like, that's not me. <laughs> She's not talking about me, so, so who is she talking about? <laughs> You know, and you can't even look behind. You know, well, there's nothing there. <laughs> De Niro says, you know, I don't see anyone else here. You think, 
but now she is. Because literally in front of her in that moment are two figures, the doppelganger and myself. You know, we're, we're there at the same time. I'm John Comfort and she doesn't know me. You know, no one who's ever racist, you know, knows the figure of color. They don't know them. But they do at the same time because of the phantom. You know, so race is really the ghost in narrative par excellence. You know? uh, I've always known that once I understood <laughs> race. And then, of course, when it comes to nine muses in which you have... Oh, there were so many questions I could ask you about, about nine muses. <laughs> yes. but, but you have these figures uh, who we see who are out in this amazing Arctic landscape, um, but we don't actually see their faces because yeah. they've got these great big yeah. sort of Berghaus kind of... <laughs> um, <laughs> Berghaus indeed, yes. Berghaus jackets <laughs> on in, in, in different colours, but, but no faces. So they are themselves quite ghostly. I mean, um, uh, the Nine Muses is, is probably like one of the most distilled um, illustrations of what I've been saying about how we work. So, you know, over the years, since the early 80s, I can't, I don't know how many uh, post-migrant elders I've interviewed or spoken to or been in conversations. I can't tell you. I mean, you know. What I can tell you, though, is that after a while you realize that if the conversation is about the arrival here, it breaks down broadly into three primal scenes. Uh, they always hit those in some order. Uh, change, it's a bit like jazz, you know, like rearranging. <laughs> Essentially, it's, if you look for it, it's there, you know. Um, once they go beyond, oh, we thought we were coming to the mother country and the milk and honey. So once they go beyond the prelude, the fantasy prelude, they enter into a kind of inner chamber. And the inner chamber has these three primal sins. One is, you know, they would tell you when they got here, it was really cold. And this didn't matter whether they came in the summer or winter. <laughs> okay. It didn't seem to matter. So you knew that you were talking about something which wasn't, it's, it's, it's the realm of fantasy here. I, I don't mean they were making it up. But, no, but it was physical yeah, cold. You know, there, there, there was an encounter with something which yeah. felt unreal, which was this place. And the second is they would always talk about being alone, either when they arrived or on the boat. Or, you know, and it, again, it didn't seem to matter whether they were with lots of other people. And, so you, you, you realize two things from those, those two observations. One is that, uh, that the act of migrancy or migrant, uh, of migrating, migrant, with what, call it what you like, is about acquiring a certain existential persona, right? A sense of your aloneness, which is necessary for you to then be thrown together. <laughs> nice. It's absolutely necessary that you were aware you were something else before you became colored, because otherwise the color doesn't work. <laughs> you can't be colored or black if you don't know that you were something before that. You know, and you have to then accept, ah, oh, I was an Igbo man from uh, airway from, now I'm a black person <laughs> or a colored person, you know. Um, and the third thing that they would talk about is this sense of, which follows on from this existential recognition, is this sense of their apartners, you know. We came and we had all this bright stuff and everybody here was dressed in really drab. And, <laughs> and essentially the Nine Muses is the distillation of those ideas. <laughs> That's really what it is, you know. It's their sense of color, the, the acquiring of, of that uh, anonymity, which is also a way of being made an individual and then plunged into, you know, uh, all and, of that. And the nine muses are the offspring of Nesemini. Is it Nesemini? Like Nemesine. 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 Oh, Nemesine. Okay, it's like mnemonic, but it's yes, Nemesine. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So she has these, um, with Deuce, she has these, these nine offspring, and they are dance and music and lyricism yeah. and all these various things. So you sort of refract 
the experience of these people through the, those nine aspects? Yes, because, um, and this was, this was a revelation when I first became aware of this, because the idea is that all our forms of expression are given birth by Nemesis, the goddess of memory. That's like an extraordinary thing to get your head around, you know, uh, because that's in fact what the, the muses are. They are, each of them are a facility, of you know, of yeah. memory, uh, whether of the tragic, of history, you know, um, and so on. And so I, it felt right even though there were going to be overlaps and they will probably all feel the same to anybody else except me, <laughs> to try and demarcate those different registers of memory as they impact on, on lives which are in this process of making it from migrants into a post-migrant state. And the post-migrant state is where they will encounter everything, you know, where there is a sense of difference or exclusionary strategies or an identity of blackness, all of that will happen in that space, not whilst they're migrants. Because when they're migrants, they feel they're from somewhere else, you know? So you overlay that with the Odyssey, you overlay it with Homer, and you overlay it with um, Joyce or Emily Dickinson, or, or yeah. all these... You know, all the just, good guys. All the good guys, <laughs> all the good guys. And it's all put together, so it turns into this. But the choice, okay, here's a really simple, Basic question. So you have these anonymous figures. Well, they're yes. not really anonymous, but they're sort of unknown, I suppose. That's yes. But uh, uh, figures. But they're in this particular snowy landscape. Is mm. it as simple as the landscape being white? Um, no. Uh, um, well, <laughs> not, yes not. and no. No, no, yes <laughs> and no. I mean, you know, um, it, it is obviously not the real space because most of it was shot in Alaska, for instance. So it's, you know, it's not Northumberland, that's for sure, or Sheffield. Um, but it's so distinctive, a space. Yeah, that... because I, it just felt to me as if we needed to remove the argument of becoming from the location. Right. You know, uh, people needed to understand that the processes we're talking about are processes that affect most post-migrant communities, but it happened to take a, that form here, yeah. because you can see in the archive that, that these people came to England. But if you, if you went to France or um, uh, Spain, the Canary Islands now, those processes, psychic, cultural and political, uh, are at play. It's how um, people move from being outsiders and qualified in, into to being qualified insiders, you know, black, British, or British, Asian. You know, those, those are the processes that lead to that. That's, that's really what I was trying to understand and, and lay out. And, but I don't think it's unique to, to England or Britain or Britishness. You know. no, and it's very beautiful as well. So, um, OK, we've got a, a few minutes left. Um, if anybody has any questions on this or other aspects. Anymore, not there. There's can't a hand. See so it. it's so dark, I can't see. Sorry, so sorry. we really can't there you see. Are. Yeah. <laughs> tell, we're not making it up. <laughs> I'm just okay. Yeah, I just wondered how much um, we talked. To, you talked a little about that theory, about film theory, and some of the theories you were engaged with at the time. And I just wondered how much they, uh, any theoretical debates um, about representation, identity, and so on. Uh, inform your work now um, in the way they might have done in uh, previous work? Not so much now, um, uh, because a lot of, a lot of what um, debates that we were initiating, you know, um, they weren't external to us. I think that's a difference. You know, people used to say, oh, you guys were so much into the theory, and the assumption was that this, this theory was happening somewhere and that we were taking it. We weren't. I mean... Uh, the work we were doing, both in the writing and making of films, was central to the theories of representation as they were emerging in the 80s, which were then going to inform what one would call black Britishness. Now, you know, black British is now a, a 
geographic, social fact. I don't need to keep going on that. <laughs> um, so, so not in quite the same way. But um, the theory wasn't, the theories weren't just the, what feels like the quote unquote political ones. I mean, there were all kinds of debates, and some of which are still with us and some are not so much. You know, so for instance, across between here and the States, there was this huge debate that went on for years about film stocks that unless you were a filmmaker of color, you'd never heard of, you know, uh, and it took in, you know, um, whether one used Kodak or Agfa or Fuji, you know, which of the three with their different hues, one being kind of more magenta-based, sign and blue, how much of that works of black skin, what is the best gel, for, you know, all, it went on and on and on. And these were, you know, like all discussions in both sensitometry and cinematography, they are deeply philosophical. <laughs> People are making choices. So that's still going on. Uh, I still care about those questions. And, but obviously, I don't shoot film anymore. So, um, mm. But some of that's migrated from, from film to, to... Yeah, that's the whole question itself. Just hand up there. She can nip up there. Thank you. Thanks. That was great, John. Uh, I just, this is really not a question in a way. It's a, give you a chance to reiterate something you said earlier about process and having to fight for process. Um, and that applies to all of us um, in a way that uh, it's easy to start to think that there's a sp special groups. It might even be felt that it applied to you, you know, that there are special groups who have some special gift uh, and they, they occupy sort of Mount Olympus or some area that's not accessible to most people. Um, and I, I just have an anecdote which I, had a profound effect on me because Mirror had a profound effect on me and I thought it was a work of genius and I thought how could that possibly have been made mm. until <coughs> the wife, Tarkovsky's wife and his camera person turned up at the film school and explained that he shot this film in a very straightforward manner and they all looked at it and thought, this is deadly boring. They then spent three years messing with it. <laughs> and when you talk about process and how that is really the most important thing, you know, it appears that the gatekeepers of all kinds, from Bill Gates to the Channel 4 commissioner, they know what the rules are. You know, that, that they, they have those. We simply have to decide how we relate to them. And the real issue is to, f to, to demand the space to find your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, I think, the major part of your message here. And it, it's incredibly valuable to everybody. And when you recognize that Mirror was a piece of shit until <laughs> they messed with it, <laughs> then you've learned something. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. No, that was great. <laughs> Actually, I'll, I'll give you another Tarkovsky story really quickly. I saw the sacrifice, you know, uh, and, and with all his stuff, you know, there was stuff I loved in it. Some I didn't, but I loved it. And, and I met the, the editor. We were at a festival in Munich together. And I said, oh, I love this film. It's great. You know. And he said, yes, what do you love about it? I said, oh, the seamlessness. You know, just the fact that there's so few cuts in it, you know, like... Uh, no jump cuts at all. He looked at me and smiled and said, there are 114 jump cuts. <laughs> <laughs> so p part of being good at a process is also learning to hide it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just, just on the edge of the aisle there, and then we're just about there. Uh, John, your, yeah. your work reflects, has always reflected the story that you are in at the time, what is going to happen in your dotage? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, that's the great Ian Reddington. And, um, and Ian was part of 
one of my processes, which was a really complicated and difficult one, uh, I, I tried to persuade Ian, along with a whole bunch of other actors, to commit to a silent film. Uh, and we would spend three weeks rehearsing to work out what to say. And um, it didn't go down very well, did it, Ian? <laughs> it went down well with some, let's say, not with others. Um, uh, Where are you going? Where are you heading? Where are you going? What, what, what are the stories ahead? Um, same as, you know, it's bizarre. I, um, just when I thought I was done with telly, you know, I'm hit by all kinds of calls to do this and that. Um, some of which I'll do um, because there are things that are important to me and I want to mark them. Um, but I will not go back to it as a kind of full-time pursuit, no, because I've got other things I want to do. I'm going to be working more and more in the gallery world. I'm mean, really having a great time doing that. And I'm developing a number of, you know, fiction pieces, for want of a better word. Um, trying to see how I can feed some of this back into, um, into feature film, direct, you know, actor-based work because I haven't done that now for about a decade, and I'm not, not in the kind of traditional sense. No. I'm itching to get back to that. So that's the future for me. Good news for actors. Then. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just about out of time now. So thank you so much for your questions, but most of all, John Acumfra, thank you for your conversation. Oh,